Good evening, everyone. Well, it's great to see such a such a large crowd here for the final city talk of the spring 2019 series uh, on sustainable cities. Uh, my name is Ruben Rose Redwood, and I'm a an associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Victoria, and I'm, I'm really glad to see you all here tonight uh, for uh, Cam Owens, who's going to be talking about um, the limits to, of sustainable edu su sustainability education. Um, I'd like to first begin by acknowledging uh, that this event is taking place on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, uh, and we're grateful uh, to be here tonight. And I'd also like to acknowledge the sponsors of the City Talks this year, uh, which is the EU Center of Excellence, the Faculty of Social Sciences, and the Department of Geography at the University of Victoria. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce Cam tonight. Uh, Cam has been here at UVic in the Department of Geography uh, since 2011, I think, 2010, I think, and uh, so almost a decade. Uh, and um, I was actually on his hiring committee when we, when we hired him, so uh, it's great to see you uh, see <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I mean, so the, the whole series of sustainable cities uh, is based, uh, for the city talks this, this semester, is based on, on a, in part on a class that Cameron has uh, typically taught on the topic of which is sustainable cities. Uh, and uh, uh, Malia, who's over here in the audience, is teaching that course now, right? Um, but um, and I think some of you in the audience are perhaps from that course, so thank you for being here. So this is you get class credit. <laughs> um, and uh, so this is a topic that I know is dear to Cameron's heart. Uh, Cam Owens had uh, received his PhD from Simon Fraser University uh, and has been here at UVic as an associate teaching professor for the past nine years or so. Uh, and um, Cam has over the, over during that time has taught. Uh, Various field schools uh, through from uh, the Cascadia Sustainability Field School from here to Vancouver to Seattle to Portland down to San Francisco a number of times and is uh, over the past few years has, has taught a European Urban Sustainability Field School which he's uh, about to embark on again uh, in May I believe and so um, so tonight he's going to be sharing his uh, thoughts and kind of re critical reflections on the past decade of sustainability field schools. Uh, so uh, let's give Cam Owens a nice warm welcome. To the Great, yeah, thank you very much. It's good to see so many people and friendly faces out there. Uh, so as, as Ruben introduced, my name's Cam Owens. I'm an associate teaching professor up at the University of Victoria in the geography department. And I've been uh, teaching and learning about sustainability for many, many years now. And uh, in 2009, 10 years ago, I led my first uh, field school focusing on sustainable cities. The course was called the Rhine in 09. Clever, right? <laughs> and it involved an itinerary that followed Europe's great river from the Swiss Alps down through the French and uh, German borderlands and eventually up to Hoogville in Holland. Um, in the North Sea. And on this trip, we studied complex human river relationships and sustainability innovations in the cities along the way. Uh, since then, I've developed an annual travel study program that gets students out of the classroom and into cities to grapple with sustainable community development, either in the Pacific Northwest, Cascadia, or in Europe. And you can see some examples of itineraries here. <laughs> So what I wanted to do tonight is, on this 10th anniversary, I guess, of the first Sustainability Field School is to look back and reflect on what I've learned about sustainability and what I've learned about uh, field courses. Recently, I've had uh, the, the very, uh, I've been very fortunate to be a part of a group of scholars, including Helga, who's right here in front of me, um, that uh, here in Victoria and across North America that have been researching field schools. And we just published this book, uh, Out There Learning Critical Reflections on Off-Campus Study Programs. So I guess I'm in the mood for looking back, for taking stock on uh, this form of education. Now I want to frame my discussion tonight in terms of limits. Uh, so I want to talk about limits in a couple different senses simultaneously. We can think of limits in terms of frontiers, here how field schools can push the limits of what we can accomplish in educating and bringing about better cities. 
But I also want to talk frankly and a little more critically about limits as constraints and share some of my apprehensions, my confusion, uh, my concerns about the potential shortcomings of, of what I might be trying to do. So the presentation will be less a research talk and more about personal reflection on you know, my, my struggle of trying to, trying to do this work. Uh, I'll be a little bit vulnerable, I guess, but I, I hope it provokes us to think creatively about education. I should also say that given the time limits of such a talk, I'll only be able to give a taste, but hopefully it whets our appetite for, uh, for further thought. So I'm going to start off by talking about the concept of uh, sustainability and the notion of sustainable cities. Then I'll give a little sense of what the field school is all about. And finally, I want to consider three reflection points, three areas where I feel uh, we potentially push the limits of sustainability education, but also with which I have some apprehensions and some unease. I guess three things that I'm grappling with. So, what is sustainability? Well, I guess in some ways it might be easier to talk about unsustainability. Many of us recognize a range of, uh, of socio-ecological concerns or crises that confront us in the 21st century threaten our long-term health and well-being. For example, a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, which might even be graver, an incredibly uneven distribution of wealth and opportunity, and closest to us here in BC, the brutality for Indigenous peoples, especially women, of ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. So sustainability then, I guess at least at its best, might be seen as some kind of affirmative response to these and other threats to the long-term health and well-being of the world. The word comes from the Latin for to hold up or to keep going. And it's had a much longer history than this, but most contemporary uses stem from its articulation in the, the, the famous UN report, Our Common Future, which came out in 1987. It articulated sustainable development is that which meets present needs uh, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And in a way, it was a, a critique of post-war development that had failed to deliver in terms of spreading wealth evenly and uh, had overstepped ecological limits. Since then, it's become an incredibly popular organizing frame for urban and regional planning and activism. Uh, it's been connected with a set of goals that you can see here, like reducing hunger, um, reducing poverty, clean water, education for women. And it's often expressed in terms of trying to align, uh, I guess, social, economic, uh, ecological, and cultural priorities. Now, of course, on the ground, sustainability has been much more complex and contested. People disagree on what constitutes needs, what we owe future generations, how ecological, social, economic, cultural priorities are to be defined, how they're to be aligned or prioritized or traded off or integrated how best to accomplish any of this, who gets to decide these kinds of questions. And despite its seeming popularity, most indicators point away from us actually realizing any meaningful version of it. As uh, my supervisor when I was a grad student at SFU, Mae Holden, who stood here a month ago, uh, says she thinks that sustainability is slippery and sticky. It's slippery in that it's notoriously difficult to define, embraced with equal fervor by those who would never agree on even the first step towards its attainment. And even among those actively pursuing it, it seems the more they do, the further they get from their goal. Right? But it's sticky in that despite a quarter century of prognostications of its terminally diseased condition as a passing ideal, uh, an overly intellectualized pairing of poverty alleviation and environmental goals, sustainability has persisted and carries value as an organizing frame for policy planning, consumer behavior, and, and on and on. So sustainability education, at least to me, is a pretty challenging thing to, to grapple with. It isn't about learning and me memorizing some self-evident concept. Rather, on the field school program, we try to trace how it's come to be variably understood, struggled over, and put into practice on the ground. We ask what political work does the term do? 
We don't automatically celebrate it as a category of incontrovertible good, uh, nor do we cynically dismiss it. Now, we look at, uh, we, we look at sustainability grounded in, in cities and focus on such elements as active transportation, bike lanes, pedestrian realm, transit systems, water, local food, urban agriculture, energy, public space access, housing, mixed use design, neighborhood development, things like that. And I guess it, it might be worth stopping and, and, and asking like why cities? Because for some ecologically minded folks, cities might be the antithesis of sustainability. Certainly when I was a younger person, I hated cities. I couldn't wait to get out of them. My home was the wilderness, was the mountains, was, was the outdoors. But I've come to see the importance of cities and the need to focus on cities if we care about planetary sustainability. For one, they're where most of us live, they're our habitats. So arguably a priority for us would be to make them livable, vibrant, fair, ecologically dynamic places. Two, they're the principal sources of resource consumption and pollution. For example, cities are responsible for 70% of energy-related greenhouse gas emissions, 80% of all energy we consume. So if we care about a sustainable planet, if we care about those wild places out there, I think we'd be advised to focus on cities. And finally, thirdly, the local municipal scale, it seems to be maybe a hopeful one in some ways with respect to accessibility and action. While national governments remain seemingly inept and paralyzed, cities seem to be kicking it a little bit, at least some have, right? So, so sustainabilities then, I think, are about one, kind of try to find some kind of uh, uh, healthier, what we might call urban metabolism, maybe a term that some of you are familiar with, just like we humans eat and drink and then expel waste, cities kind of take in resources and energy and, and water and expel pollution and garbage and waste and, and, uh, and greenhouse gas emissions. So in some ways, sustainable cities are about trying to tame that metabolism or better uh, create some kind of a closed loop. But I think it's also about things like resilience, uh, regeneration, you know, restoring the damage we've already done, and conviviality, living well together, and really importantly, and centrally, inclusiveness and justice. It was about long-term community well-being. Now, there's all kinds of other words we could use. I'm not necessarily wedded to the concept of sustainability. I think all of these are other terms that are used. They all have slightly different meanings. They're used in slightly different ways. I think they also all have their own baggage. So I, what... On our field programs, what we're interested in is the pathways to good things happening in cities and the significant barriers in the way, and curious about the language within which these are cloaked, but not necessarily committed to a, a set of terms. All right? So as I said before, we're not here just uncritically celebrating sustainability nor cynically dismissing it. So I wanted to just share a little bit about what the field school's all about. Some in this room have actually been on it. I wish I could take everyone in this room. I think it's a cool opportunity. Um, the trips begin with a week of classroom instruction where students are immersed in the literatures of sustainability, uh, regional geography, field methods, plus we get a little sense of our, our own local context. Uh, then we get into the travel study part of it uh, itself. Once on the road, we travel on carefully crafted itineraries by train, by bus, by boat, by bike, by foot, um, to cities to engage with planners and community leaders and activists, uh, others, and try to learn about their efforts and their innovations, their struggles, their frustrations and their breakthroughs in grappling with the daunting challenges that cities face. We live together in hostile type accommodation, building our own little community, and the students, they keep detailed field journals, they engage in group reflective sharing circles, they keep a video blog, uh, and undertake community service projects upon return, where they turn their knowledge and enthusiasm into tangible affirmative efforts to improve local sustainability. And you see some students here, for example, uh, presenting some of the cool things they learned to Esquimalt City Council. Uh, this so-called legacy project is super important, I find, in our program. It's part of our attempt to creatively offset the, the impacts of our travel. 
Uh, I strongly, strongly believe in the value of, of, of traveling and learning in other contexts, but we realize that there's some potential hypocrisy in going, flying across the world to study sustainability. So this is something that's really important to us, is trying to creatively offset that by students coming back and working on dedicated projects in the field. We have an incredible privilege to do something like this, and whatever we can, can do, we will, to cultivate an ethic of service and, and giving back. Now, the course learning outcomes kind of change or evolve, but um, this list gives some sense of what we hope to accomplish, a transformed learner, but what does that mean? Well, someone that comes back able to ask better <laughs> questions, right? ask more piercing, more penetrating, more capacious, more um, contextualized questions. Uh, comes back with an enhanced political literacy, so realizing sustainability isn't just some simple technical scientific um, domain, but something deeply personal, deeply cultural, deeply political. All right, a little bit of reflexivity, meaning a little bit more self-awareness, understanding how students themselves are embedded in you know processes of unsustainability, and they also can be agents of change. Right. And I guess the final one about that change is action with traction, that students come back and, and actually do things differently um, upon return. Um, I've written about this uh, elsewhere, so I, I won't go into too much detail, but I wanted to mention just that I feel the field program works by harnessing a range of special powers, superpowers or something. So the power of immersion and continuity, the power of direct experience, the power of active and emotional learning, the power of a supportive learning community, the power of multi-perspectival and place-based learning, and the power of story and example, coming back with um, some experiences and some stories to, to guide them further. And, and, and sort of the base or the anchor of the field school is this really simple analytical framework where the students go out and really we meet with, with people that are doing things uh, creatively in the world, and, 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 and we learn about these different perspectives. What do they see as the underlying problem? Right? What's, how do we diagnose the problematic present? What's their vision of a, of a desired future? What are the pathways to get there, and what are the barriers in the way? So the students fill up their field notebook with these reflections and come back with all these, you know, what are the ways forward? What are the things in the way? Where are we trying to get? And, um, you know, there's some some overlap, there's some contradiction between the people we meet. And this is what kind of makes for a, a, some kind of a robust educative experience. Anyone from the 2017? <laughs> That's just to say I, I'm with you. Um, good, so I wanted to introduce the term sustainability and sustainable cities. I wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of the field school and now what I want to do in the remainder of the time I have here is to talk about three areas of reflection on sustainability learning. These are places where I think we push the balance of education in a good way but I'm also a little bit uneasy with and I want to, I want to share as I say you know both my, my excitement and my unease here and hopefully uh, invite all of you into this conversation too. So by imagination and vision, I mean that sustainability itself, but sustainability education too, is energized by a creative imagination and a bold, audacious vision for a better world, by hope and lightness as an antidote to cynicism, despair, and disengagement. So I try to set a tone on the course, we call it critical optimism, right? Not naive optimism, not everything's gonna work out okay, and not debilitating cynicism either, but uh, this kind of critical optimism. And we're kind of buoyed up by, um, by this quote from Paul Hawkins, an environmental scientist and author, and he's asked frequently, you know, are you pessimistic or optimistic about the future? And he says, if you look at the science about what is happening on Earth, and aren't pessimistic, you don't understand data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore the earth and the lives of the poor, and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. What I see everywhere in the world are ordinary people willing to confront despair, power, and incalculable odds in order to restore some semblance of grace, justice, and beauty in the world. And so, what we want to do on the field school is 
get out there and see, meet with people that are trying to restore grace, justice, and beauty in the world. And in that, that week that we meet, uh, before we head off, we also read this article by Donella Meadows, who some of you may be familiar with, an essay she wrote called Envisioning a Sustainable World, which tries to encourage students to, to think big and to, to be visionary. Meadows was a pioneering American environmental scientist, teacher, uh, author, whose Limits to Growth, which came out in 1972, is kind of a seminal work in sustainability studies. Uh, she was noted for her extensive work creating models to understand carrying capacity and, and resource unsustainability, things like that. Now, it's important to note that she was immersed in rigorous science, uh, uh, technical quantitative research. Yet she wrote this article in 1994 where she outlined the absolute importance of imagination and creative visioning. She tells this fascinating story about a series of workshops that she ran where she brought all the top nutritionists, agronomists, development workers, demographers together to try to address world hunger. So she started this workshop off by asking everyone assembled, so all the top people in the world dealing with global hunger. And she asked, what would the world be like if there was no hunger? All right? So what do you think happened? When she asked those gathered to describe not the world they thought they could achieve or the world that they would settle for, but the world that they truly wanted. Well, she was greeted with anger and derision. What a stupid question. Visions are dangerous fantasies. Stop being so unrealistic. Now, interestingly, after these initial objections were tabled, the deeper ones started coming out. I can't stand thinking about a world without suffering because I'm so painfully aware of the suffering all around me. Or, I don't want to get my hopes up. Or, I have a vision but I feel childish expressing it. And this later remark stuck with her. Um, she was still thinking about it 10 years later when she wrote this article. She said, why is it that we can share our cynicism, our complaints, our frustrations with perfect strangers, but without hesitation, right? but we can't share our dreams. How did we arrive at a culture that had labeled visions as childish and that constantly, almost automatically ridiculed visionaries? Whose idea of reality forces us to be realistic? Now, she's a hardcore scientist, right? Recognizes we need more than just imagination. We need to figure out effective plans. But she was absolutely adamant that vision and imagination were central to bringing about a sustainable world. And she came back to thinking about children. She said that children, before they are squashed by cynicism, heartbreaking, are natural visionaries. They can tell you clearly and firmly what the world should be like. There should be no war. There should be no pollution. There should be no cruelty. There should be no starving children. There should be music. There should be fun. There should be beauty. There should be lots and lots of nature. People should be trustworthy and growing up shouldn't work so hard, right? Mm -hmm. However, as they grow up, she says, children learn that these visions are childish and stop saying them out loud. But she contends that inside all of us, if we haven't been too badly bruised, there are these glorious visions. So I ask my students on the field school, I ask everyone in this room tonight to suspend their self-constraint and think Think boldly. This image here is an exercise in Havana, Cuba, where people did just like just that. They imagined what Havana could look like. Not the Havana that they thought they could achieve or the Havana that they'd settle for, but the Havana that they truly wanted. So out in the field school, we encounter some projects like this. And I just want to highlight a, three of them here. Um, this is Social Bite, which our group from last year visited in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, it's a very cool social enterprise. It's uh, a not-for-profit sandwich shop, which has the bold, audacious vision of eradicating homelessness in Scotland. That's its goal. Its overriding principle is the eradication of homelessness in Scotland. The shop runs a pay-it-forward service where customers can and do pay for meals for, for help the houseless. It distributes over 140,000 items of food and drinks to needy people each year. It opens up shops for social suppers in the evenings where people can sit in, have hot food, and get access to support services. 
It raises awareness by sponsoring the Sleep in the Park event where thousands of people sleep in the rough to raise awareness and money for folks without housing. It hires folks who have who've, uh, uh, experienced houselessness and it invests money into building villages to help people get back on their feet. Or how about the, the bold and audacious vision of the Rebuilding Centre we visit on our Cascadia trip in Portland, Oregon. It's a nonprofit that deconstructs homes instead of demolishing them and then resells the materials at affordable costs to fund programs to support social sustainability efforts in Northeast Portland. It hires local people to work. It freely shares its business plan and ideas. So they're cropping up around North America. The ReStore here in Victoria, for example, comes from this model, all right? And so there's great benefits to this, this process. So you can see here um, that um, the savings from one home being deconstructed instead of demolished. The savings in terms of electricity, in terms of uh, generating six jobs for every one in demolition, the CO2 released into the atmosphere, the materials saved from the, um, the landfill. So a bold vision to rethink the materials economy. Or how about Sevilla, Spain, where we're going to visit this summer, uh, which reimagined itself as a cycling city. If anyone's been to Spanish cities, they're not bike friendly, and Seville was no exception at all. It was choked with cars four rush hours a day, right? There's the siesta rush hours too. So it's, uh, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't an enjoyable, enjoyable place to get around. Uh, but a gra grassroots activist took advantage of uh, generous EU funding and a progressive city council to push for what would become 80 kilometers of separated bike lanes. We've got eight kilometers planned here, so 10 times. Uh, and now there's 70,000 cyclists and rising virtually from none to 70,000, about 9% of the commutes and rising. There's a boom in the bike economy. And local activists like Ricardo Marquez here, who took me out for a, a ride around the city and told me about how this happened, says, you know, if it can happen in Sevilla, it can happen anywhere, right? So this is about a bold vision. So as I said, I tried to set up the field school so that students connect with such inspirational people and projects. I've sought to inspire hope and counter some of the cynicism and despair that we sometimes get, you know, when we take courses in environmental studies or geography or things like that. But I'm not entirely easy with this, and I want to share um, a little bit of my apprehension here. It's not that I agree with the skeptical types that were sitting in Meadows' workshop that we, were, you know, we should be more pragmatic and not have vision and imagination. More there's some niggling feeling about whether the hopeful tone is always appropriate. Um, I came across across this quote from Greta Thunberg, who is, uh, you know, this 16-year-old Swedish. Um, student who's led the, the student strikes in Europe and spread around the world. She says that, you know, adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as if your house is on fire, because it is. So, does optimism, even the critical optimism that I'm trying to inspire my students, does it ring shallow in a world that seems so dark right now, seems so urgent? Are we at a point where it's not so much about bold, creative visions for the future, but survival in the present? Is it not so much about hope as it is about desperation? Is hope kind of the, you know, the purview of the privilege? So that's one thing that I'm grappling and struggling with, and I'd love to uh, include you in that conversation, we can come back to you and what you think. What is the appropriate tone for talking about our sustainable way forward? Now, the next thing that I wanted to share um, is about diversity and inclusiveness. So here my thesis is sustainability education is, or it should be, centered on diversity and inclusivity. That the shape of sustainable cities be guided by the voices of kids, the elderly, women, people of color, indigenous people, so-called disabled, those with uh, other sexual orientations. In other, words, in other words, those for whom the city has often been a hostile and unwelcoming place. And I've endeavored to make that more and more the focus of the field schools, to consider sustainably, sustainability deeply multi-perspectively. So we've encountered cities that have put kids 
um, at the center. Enrique Peñalosa, the former mayor of Bogota, Colombia, says that if we can build a successful city for children, we'll have a successful city for all people. And so we encounter these kinds of places in Amsterdam, these play streets. This used to be a normal street choked with cars and is now literally a playground, a play in the street. You know, so what does it mean to build cities for play instead of for cars? What does it mean when Copenhagen brings its harbor back and, and to a point where you can swim in it now and, and creates this kind of public space, a blue space? How about parks that have been designed not only for children, but actually by children, like this space in, in Hafen City in, in Hamburg? When, uh, when Peñalosa says that uh, a, sustainable, you know, a child-friendly city would be a great city for all, I think this is what he's talking about. If you see the kinds of things, what would be good for kids? If we centered in kids in building our cities, what would be good? Well, safety, active frontage, passive surveillance, conducive to walking and cycling, lower speed limits, accessible public places, education and health services in close proximity, provision of nature and wildlife, green spaces. Aren't those the kinds of cities that maybe everyone, not just kids, would want to live in? And at the other end of the spectrum, what about elderly people? Here's an inspiring project. Cycling Without Age is a free program that's pioneered by Ole Kassel, who we meet up with in Copenhagen, that addresses the isolation that elderly people often feel. Volunteer pilots, it could be university students, take elderly folks in care homes uh, out for bike rides in the city to take in the scenery, get some fresh air, enjoy conversation, and get some much needed outside time. So the, pro the program is working against the marginalization of the elderly in the modern city, promoting mental, physical, spiritual health and well-being, transgenerational interaction and connection. This project was so, so inspiring that my wife Christy has helped to start actually a chapter here in Victoria. Um, so you can answer questions about it. <laughs> <laughs> or how about this? Um, Dutch universities, we've, we've seen this in Amsterdam, but I think it's actually spreading to other parts of Europe as well, uh, where university students are living in nursing homes. This little bit in the top that you probably can't read says, Jurian gets free lodgings with 84-year-old Anton in return for 30 hours a month of care work. All right, so here's kind of addressing two problems at once, right? You've got a problem with students trying to find affordable accommodation. And you've got elderly people who could use some help um, and some communication and some connection. Right? So a really exciting project that, that focuses and thinks about sustainable cities more inclusively, this, this case in terms of age. Or one uh, last exciting project or set of projects we found in Copenhagen that embodies this inclusive spirit Engage Square and Folks Park are vibrant public spaces designed to be accessible to all people, not just kids, not just elderly people, not just families, but actually those vulnerable populations that are often ignored in public planning. Drug users, the houseless, transients, uh, people suffering from addictions, rebel teenagers, right? These places were carefully designed with clear sight lines, careful use of lighting, and most importantly, an incredibly responsive and patient community engagement to create spaces that would make a, a, a place where uh, for for everyone for typically shunned citizens. I won't put them on the spot, but someone in this room, Jack, is uh, looking at this project is his honors thesis. So. An emphasis on the field program then is to inspire how we can think about sustainable cities as inherently diverse and inclusive cities. How can cities be made to work for everyone? So what are my apprehensions here? Well, one, I suppose one concern is that we can't take it for granted that diversity and inclusion are valued in our current political climate. More personally, I can't help but think that my ability to showcase inclusive urban environments is, is constrained, is limited by my own experience my own background. I'm the kind of person for which the kinds of wealthy cities in the global north that we visit actually work very well for. So in setting up the field school, I make decisions about the people and projects we connect with, the decisions, and these decisions are, are constrained by 
what I think will work is a good practical itinerary, my networks, my connections, who's willing and able to meet with us, um, the limited time we spend in each location. So as much as I try to set up a multi-perspectival experience, I, I always wonder about my blind spots. So finally, the last area of, of uh, both excitement and apprehension is about experimentation and action. So here my thesis is that sustainability education is or it should be about local experimentation, taking chances, moving from idea to action as an antidote to rigidity over analysis and inertia. And perhaps I think this is one of the most valuable things students come back with is they were, or why they're thrilled about the field school is they met folks who were just doing it, right? Mark Lakeman was here two months ago as a city, giving a city talk, and he's one of the highlights <laughs> of his program, City Repair, is one of the highlights of our Cascadia field school. Um, we usually plan our trips down to meet up with, uh, it's called the Village Building Convergence that Mark helps to organize, which is the largest gathering of placemakers, urban permaculturalists, and other radical urban rethinkers in America. Mark, through his architectural practice, facilitates artistic and ecologically oriented projects, educating and inspiring communities to creatively transform <coughs> the places where they live. And it all began when Mark and his neighbors transformed their otherwise totally typical suburban block in, uh, in South Portland. They tore down the fences, they restored the land, they brought back a little water course that used to run through their, their typical block, uh, and they reimagined the streetscape. They painted intersections, installed public art, a tea station, one of the first of those little mini libraries. Their experiments, illegal at first, have transformed the aesthetic of Portland and many cities beyond. You can actually see a lot of Mark's influence in Victoria in places like Fernwood and Vic West. Right. So someone that's just, that's just doing it. Or how about this place, also in Amsterdam, De Kurgel. It's a super cool, small community of social enterprises that sprung up on a heavily polluted industrial site in North Amsterdam, Amsterdam Noor. It's based on the principles of closed loop metabolism and experimentation. So for example, rather than digging up the toxic soil and having it shipped off somewhere else, which we typically do, make the problem someone else's, they are experimenting with phytoremediation. Have people heard of that? I didn't know much about it, but I've learned about it. Fascinating, using plants um, and experimenting with plants to see how plants can react to actually clean the soil in different ways. All the buildings are made of recycled and reused materials, mostly retrofitted houseboats that they pulled up on shore and then connected with walkways so they can, you know, sort of avoid the, the, the toxic soil while, they're, while the plants are remediating it. There's a cool cafe that features all locally grown food and experiments with aquaculture and organic farming. And just a, a cool space to meet. And then finally bringing it back home. Many of you may be familiar with topsoil, and uh, my good friend Chris Hildreth, who wasn't able to make it tonight, but um, I'll give a shout out to him anyway, because it's a perfect example of this experimental spirit. Topsoil works on urban spaces that would otherwise go unused, like rooftops or, uh, or vacant blocks awaiting development. The large project that you see here is in a part of the Dockside Green Development Project on the, on the, on the harbor here, um, across the, the, base, the Bay Bridge. Um, that's waiting, eventually there will be a building put on here. But in the meantime, why not use it for something like growing organic food that he sells to restaurants nearby, transforming you know, these kind of spaces into productive, profitable agricultural spaces creating a sustainable, hyper-local uh, food economy. So again, this is something that's uh, you know, an exciting element, I think, of sustainability. Sustainability education is just doing it. And last year, on our field school, uh, Jonathan Tinney, who, is, who used to be the director of planning for the city of Victoria, joined us. And it was really cool, because he came along with us and was able to offer his professional perspective um, 
And also, it was great for me because students could say, you know, we, we stumble on some awesome project in Copenhagen, and they ask, like, oh, why can't we do this back in Victoria? And I could say, well, ask him. <laughs> but one of the most interesting things is he kept saying to a number of those projects, actually, there's no reason why we can't do that in Victoria. Why aren't you doing that in Victoria? So this was this sort of inspiration to you know, empower students to take a little bit of ownership in our city. So, apprehensions. Well, the nature of my field program, and perhaps all field programs, I don't know, is to focus on the local. I connect students to inspiring local people that are taking immediate local action. But I'm wary that we largely neglect other scales of action, unless they sort of interact with that scale. We, you know, we don't focus as much on, in Europe, on the EU. We don't focus as much at the national scale or regional scale. So, while my own personal politics in some ways favors this deep democratic action of see the potential of these grassroots efforts networking and scaling up, am I providing too limited an understanding of sustainability? And secondly, it's also clear to me that experimentation and direct action isn't always a positive thing. Right? I've written about this elusive balance in sustainability education between careful, critical reflection and, and just doing it, taking action. And this is part of a, an article that I wrote with a, with a couple students. And sustainability education often privileges one of the two, robust critical reflection or a pragmatic action orientation. Maniates argues that too many sustainability-focused programs privilege applied problem-solving over critical reflection. In so doing, such programs neglect careful consideration of how action fits into a larger mosaic of political power, cultural transformation, and social change. Without nuanced critical reflection, practical action can unintentionally reproduce insidious infrastructures of power. Conversely, programs may focus exclusively on critical theory while foreclosing outlets for hopeful, practical, and creative action. If the hatchet of deconstruction is wielded without the seed of practical action, students are left as disempowered, indignant spectators. So this is the challenge here of trying to you know, embrace the seed of creative action and doing something while also this, this hatchet of critical interrogation. And I struggle to, to, to see if I'm, if I'm achieving that balance. So, what I wanted to do tonight was to, <laughs> to show this really cute picture of me with a little piglet. <laughs> but also to uh, introduce the concept of sustainability and su sustainable cities as, as we grapple with them, to give you a little bit of background into our field school program and then to share these three things that I'm grappling with. Um, one, you know, what is the proper tone for this kind of education? Hopeful or desperate? How to meaningfully embed diversity and inclusion in our efforts to uh, promote sustainability, sustainable cities? And finally, that was two, three, um, what about this emphasis on local action and experimentation. So I'll leave you with these shots of Amsterdam, Cycling City, and I thank you. May we find the courage to confront despair, power, and incalculable odds to bring some grace, justice, and beauty into this world. Thank you very much. Do you have time for questions, anyone? Yeah. Were thoughts on my three struggles? Um, I, I don't know if you might have partially addressed this, but um, how do you uh, uh, see imposing upon people that don't want to be involved in, in improving the lot for the future? They're only concerned about here and now. How do you? imposing your ideas upon them or well I guess in this program I'm not really imposing the, the, the students voluntarily join us and the people we meet up with are involved in this so I guess it's less about um, imposing and more about 
giving space to those projects that are actually making a difference and trying to help them to grow um, rather than, I guess, confronting those that, that are standing in the way of that. But I think it's a good question. How do you I mean, communicate you, with people that aren't convinced or aren't... Uh, I, I guess my question has to do with how much authority do you want to give to power? How much power do you want to give to government in order to bring about sustainable progress? Well, I guess that's one of the things I'm grappling with because, my, as, I, as I said, my approach has been more to connect with those sorts of projects and efforts that are making that difference, but I recognize that the shortcoming of that is that, uh, you know, how many of these little topsoils does it take to equal what government could do if they imposed a strict carbon tax or something, right? So. But I guess it's not the focus of the, the field program, but I get that, I, I get that. that that's, and that's actually why I put that as one of my apprehensions, is we don't attend to sort of larger scale change in this program. Instead, we're kind of celebrating those efforts that are making a difference on the ground. But yeah. I don't ignore that that's not an important scale to work at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a couple thoughts. Um, also, thank you so much. This is really exciting. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I hope you give this lecture like, at least a few times. Oh, oh, thank people you. Would benefit from this. Yeah, I think it's really important to try to share this information as widely as possible because sometimes we are a bit isolated in Victoria from the larger environmental movement. So um, I also wonder, would it be helpful to try to lobby the city, to lobby different levels of government to try to implement this on a large scale? Like if we in Victoria had all of the parks people with a huge budget doing this kind of thing, I'm not sure they would rather do this, like set up gardens, help set up like permaculture on the city boulevards, instead of no lawns. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess I grew up in Calgary, so when I've come to Victoria, I found it actually as, you know, a fairly progressive city council. And the yeah. mayor actually comes to our, to, uh, start off our week when we're here in Victoria and we did we had a planner that joined us I think sometimes you know the resistance isn't always at the government level in fact you know the, the government here has tried to implement a, 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 a active transportation plan and bike lanes um, but it's been pretty resisted by a lot of people in Victoria not necessarily the government it seems like a lot of it has to do with <coughs> the impact of culture change too like a change of values you know yeah. people have to start thinking of Oh, it would be great to have gardens everywhere, like big spaces where people can play. And I wonder like, if we could try to get these kinds of spaces in, in Victoria like, as soon as possible, because that's what's like, being asked us right now. This place could also be like learning centers where people can come and, and like, have free workshops and it's volunteer run or like, you know, it's another job, which is fun and wonderful. Yeah, I like the way you frame that and just like how. You know, wouldn't you want to live in a place where, it, you know, I think of yeah, back to this, having this vision, like, wouldn't you want to live in a place that that's like that? Like, we have to reinvent that? the story. Reinvent yeah. what defines beautiful and good in someone. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. No, good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah I, I guess it, it, it's curious when you try and figure out the relationships between people that are doing the grassroots movements and um, government who are sort of like managers essentially, so you, you have this strong push of like progressive movement met by the conservatives that generally sit in government, and how that relationship might actually play out so you can use <laughs> both of them, and it, it for me, and I came in kind of late, but on the tail end when you're talking about like the, just acting on it and like moving forward and there's shortcomings to that without the critical reflection, and what I see government do often is they spend a lot of time reflecting, like they put a lot of thought in first, they have all these plans and studies before they can really move on stuff. And if there'd be a way to create a check where you have spaces where people can um, experiment, but then you have the conservatives who play a more like monitoring role. So no, they're not the ones that are actually implementing it, but they're the ones that come in and check that things are like um, going good. And if it is, then you know, you get that like incubator where people are getting taught the skills and given the resources, and as it starts to scale up, you can start to like feed more resources into it. Um, yeah, I think it'd be a really cool relationship. Yeah.
yeah, that relationship, and, I, and, and as I say, I think the relationship is fairly healthy in Victoria. I think there is, you know, between the city government and a lot of grassroots organizations, it isn't always that healthy. I remember being at the big, um, the big uh, school strike climate march at the at the legislature, and, and Lisa helps there actually ask, you have to put pressure on government to make us do these kinds of things. I think in particular she was talking about giving free transit passes to kid, to, to youth. And she said, but you, you know, we can't do that on our own. We need, you know, we need the people to, to push for that. I think there was a question over. Yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah. bringing it back to that first point about a tone and yeah. more pedagogy. I, I certainly think that you're not the only one struggling with that, whether it's field school or otherwise, trying to figure out what's the tone of uh, the crisis that we're in, but also trying to, and I, I'm struck by two things. One, I was thinking about uh, a podcast I was listening to recently by somebody, uh, the guest was Jason Edward Lewis, who's a direct co-director of uh, Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace, which is a sort of initiative that I don't really want to get into, but his comment was about indigenous futurism and the idea that uh, for indigenous people, sometimes his feeling was that the art they created at their school was about bracketing off these problems as a necessary way of being like, we just have to bracket this off because that's not a thing to see that future. So I certainly think there's nothing uh, negative about kind of that, which is what this photo is, kind of bracketing off of some of these problems. I'm also thinking about that tone is not necessarily permanent or fixed, even throughout the field school. And I wonder how much of the tone is also set by the collective of students that you engage with and just kind of your thoughts on it. As much as you are the supposed arbiter of knowledge on the trip, you're kind of all negotiating that tone as you experience these different things, right? It's kind of more of an affect. Yeah, that's super insightful, yeah. Tyler, and that's certainly the thing. And I think actually we've done a lot of research on student learning. And one of the things, probably the most prominent thing that came out of it was that students learn from each other more than they learn from me or more than they learn from even the people that we met. And so, and I and I'm, I guess also, I like what you're saying because it takes a little pressure off, right? It's not, I, I'm not just worrying about the tone. We all have to kind of set that tone, right? Yeah, yeah, it's about giving agency to the whole group. And yes. Not, I, don't, I would hate for you to feel like, you know, I guess as a, just from a pedagogy point, like feeling like you're failing in that. I think it's such a struggle right now that we're all kind of grappling with. So. Right. Students as well. Yeah. I might be able to add something to that too. I'm thinking about the use of the word tone, and when you say setting the tone, instantly it conjures an idea that it's like a cynical idea that you you get to choose and that you have to that you have to wield power over the people that you're with. So the only power we have is setting our own tone, and and in a in a sense. The, the responsibility we have is to our own child. And when you were talking about the child who said that the house was on fire, that when we set the tone, if we can be uh, cognizant of our panic or our despair or our fire, which will come out of our experience, which is why in comfortable places sometimes we struggle to connect with it and we have to look to places where people are really suffering to try and reconnect with that. But it's there, it, it's in all of us, because we've all come out of a history of, of tragedy and, and conflict and battle and despair and fire. So setting the tone, as, as I see it, would be consciously, is being completely honest with the people that are with you and working in your own way to be connected to that place so that when you're with the students that you are allowing them to, or not even allowing, but showing them how through your field school, through your travelling, they get to <coughs> know that in themselves. Because when we collectively know that, then we won't give the power to the government or to the, once we know it in ourselves, we'll collectively agree that we can act because we'll have a foundation of agreement. It won't be foreign to us. We won't be, we won't be taking a stand against 
pollution and because it's outside of ourselves, we'll be taking a stand because in our completely selfish, vested interest, we, at a gut level, can feel the fire. We can feel how, what an emergency this is. And it seems to me that in, the, in, in Victoria or in Auckland, where I'm from, the problem is that we've become complacent and disconnected from our child or from our emergency or from our remembering of what life is all about. And because of that, we can't act. So thank you, Tyler, for making sense of that in an intelligent way. And uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much. That's actually the big challenge is how do we bring this back to, back here, back to the classroom, back to, uh, so we've done a, a couple shorter length field schools. I actually ran one with uh, Chris Hildreth, who's the topsoil um, founder. And it was like a two week intense food in the city, it's called, and it was basically we got out onto his farm here right in Victoria, so it was actually free. It was a free, it was just written like, like a course, but delivered like a field school. Um, but you raise a really important point. I mean, I think this is something also that I struggle with. It's a very privileged um, opportunity. Not everyone can go, even if, it, even if it wasn't based on money, it's still a small group of people, no matter what, are going to be able to experience that. It's not an experience that every student can have. So I take that as it's a really valuable contribution and something to I don't know how to how to address. We have lo more local trips. Uh, we try to find more funding to support students to be able to go on trips. So we, we run the Claycott Sound Field School now and we have three scholarships for indigenous students can, that can get fully covered for that. So that's one example of that. But it's a really good point. Thanks. Which are the most successful cities when it comes to rush hour and handling these congestions? What do you remember are the most successful patterns? Well, it's really funny. I mean, the most successful cities from an automobile standpoint are the ones like Copenhagen and Amsterdam, other Dutch cities, Utrecht, that, that are... Uh, that don't have, you know, that are overwhelmingly biked, but there are some pretty crazy bike jams <laughs> and rush hours in those cities. Especially Amsterdam. Actually, I guess my, my answer to that would be Dutch cities other than Amsterdam, because a lot of Dutch cities have fantastic cycling infrastructure and don't have the density and, and you know, are the population of Amsterdam, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if there would be any use in uh, of coming back from some of these schools. If, if you were to use some of your findings of things that appeal, not in the, uh, you know, from any of these schools, to send those impressions and information to groups. For example, it could be people with uh, uh, disabilities from places where we've seen where they've been catered to and not to forget within those groups the activists and the complainers and see if they can be turned around uh, to uh, you know propose and become activists themselves and it seems in connection with that Yes, we need lots of vision, but you need perhaps um, just a few pictures 
of cynicism insofar as that they may point the way away from the more difficult paths to the easy ones to reach the vision. We haven't done exactly that, but then when I was talking about the legacy projects, one of the main um, center pieces of the field program is that students come back here and they do share what they've learned in various ways and also invest their energy into projects either at the city level or nonprofits. Um, and so, and hopefully the students come back as, as change makers themselves, many of them are. Um, one of the one of the tools when I was in analyzing the field program and like was it making a difference or not? Um, the, the surprising tool was actually we have group Facebook pages for all of the field schools, and I'd be able to kind of see what students were doing. And even our 2012 group, there's at least a, a, at least one person here from our 2012 group. Um, I would look on the I, I would see where they've you know where they've gone on and made a difference. They would still be posting things about you know, opportunities and what they were doing and what, what, you know, what changes they were making and what events that we could collectively get together. We had a five-year anniversary where we brought, after the five years of doing the field schools, we brought all of the field school students from all five of those um, experiences together for like a big kind of party, but also like a sharing of what we've done since, what, how have we transformed our, uh, you know, how has the field school transformed how has it led you to make action with traction? I think there was a question right here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, I was wondering if you might, I really appreciate your work, and oh, I was you. wondering if you might, uh, perhaps as a way of confronting some of the things that concern you, have a few hours that's focused on throwing students conceptually with readings and discussion into a context like uh, for example, um, Brazil at present, and with the present president who thinks that the dictatorship should be celebrated. So how do you fit sustainability into a context on and connect it on all levels to uh, power uh, and culture and society and history in a context where there's such severe uh, issues to, to, to contend with, and certainly um, what's happening to the rainforest is huge, and uh, it just, just throwing people into a very different context conceptually like that, that forces them to get out of the comfort zones and think of the intersection that really leads us to some of the most difficult questions and makes us clear as to just how huge the forces that we have to confront are. Yeah, see, that's where I think maybe the field program falls short. Because uh, most of my classes will, will confront uncomfortable situations like that. But in the field school, as I say, I see kind of the, this role of countering some of the uh, students come through environmental studies, geography programs, pretty overwhelmed, pretty uh, you know, pretty maybe disenchanted. They learn about, you know, certainly focus on uh, power imbalances and, and, you know, closer to home, even without even going to Brazil, thinking about the um, ongoing violence against indigenous peoples here in, in this province. Uh, the field school, we don't ignore um, at all. I try that not to make this, like I say, not naive optimism, but it's basic, but it's really trying to be connecting students with these hopeful projects that they probably haven't encountered no, in, I think that's in their classwork. Important. So, but I hear, I hear exactly what you're saying. And certainly the field is not a place where, I mean, we curate to, we, we curate the experience for the most part. I mean, I set up where we're going to go, but there's always this opportunity for the unpredictable, the unscripted in field schools and just, uh, Briefly, for one example here, when we were in, I think in our, maybe 2013, we were in a place in Portland, and we went to this, what's called the Eco Flats Development, and it's uh, 
a great example of bike-oriented development and energy-efficient design. It had an array of solar panels on the roof, and all the students were at rock, like, this is an incredible development, sustainability, and that. And this, uh, this woman, who I've come to know, Michelle DePass, African-American community organizer, Northeast Portland came and kind of joined our group. We didn't know who she was at first, and she walked around. And then at the end, as the, the developer who had showed us this great, this great project, uh, she sort of spoke up and said, well, what was here before? And then started to tell the story about eco-gentrification, how this, you know, this beautiful, shiny, sustainable development had come at the expense of the Northeast Portland's African-American community, who ironically had been sustainable. They lived in small houses, worked close to where they lived, rode bikes, walked to work, grew food in their garden, but it didn't look like sustainability to the, you know, the, the white majority population in Portland. So that wasn't, a, that wasn't a scripted, that wasn't an intended outcome, but it became a really, really important learning moment in that field school from which, you know, students really started understanding questions of sustainability in the context of race relations and, and inequality. Thank you. Emmanuel, did you have a and question? It's more a, question, it's more a comment than a question. Yeah. I tend to disagree with you. You want to empower your students. And your place of empowerment is the local community, the urban community. And I think it's a really nice unit for to ground people and to conform to a multitude of, you know, like community issues from transportation to sustainability across the board and water and so on and so forth. I don't know if you can do more. On the other hand, maybe we should think about it, and that's kind of a question for artists. Should we develop courses mm -hmm. that actually address other areas where sustainability are policies that are different forms, like you know, the provincial level, the state provincial level discussions, or the federal level discussions, where we could compare these kind of discussions in the EU, in the US, in Canada, in Brazil, for instance, or the regional level, but broader regions than just a city or you know, even metro, for instance. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, and I think that's a really, really difficult but also fascinating way of you know, looking at sustainability issues, especially if we're really committed. Yeah. We can't take the piece that you're doing away. We just mm -hmm. need to grow from it. And I think a really important part of that, um, and I'm not sure exactly if this is what you're, you're suggesting, but one of the problems with field programs, and it gets back to the, the, the question that you raised about, uh, about the um, limited number of people that can go on a field program is we actually don't normally have too many prerequisites because we know it's an expensive course so students come in maybe without that kind of background so potentially if the program fit could be integrated more seamlessly into a program where students do learn about um, <coughs> other scales or, or you know other contextual factors that would be helpful for them on the trip um, better but we're kind of you know we cobble things together yeah you have a question or right. we'll come back to you <laughs> I guess it's not exactly the same, but one thing that we've done is we have a bit of a relationship with the university in the Netherlands, the University of Groningen in the northern Netherlands, and they actually send a field school studying cities here. Well, they come they come from the Netherlands to go to Vancouver, uh, Victoria, and Seattle. And so there's you know opportunities to for our students here to meet with Dutch students and then exchange you know ideas or you know, or whatever about city building. Good, but yeah, thank you. 
There was a question over here. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned that you had a city planner from Victoria come with you on the trip, yeah. and that he, that some of the ideas you came across on your trip, uh, he said that uh, there would be no problem about doing that in Victoria. Uh, what were some of those projects that? Well, that's a good question. Um, planting fruit trees was one. Okay. You know, and that uh, said, oh, it's so cool. They can just plant fruit trees here. Well, Victoria actually does have that program similarly. Mm -hmm. But it was more, I can't remember now the specifics, but it was more like, you know, there, the take home message was we sometimes build up these big barriers that, oh, the city, pro the, the city probably won't let us do this or do that. And it's not always the case. It's we don't do something innovative sometimes because just no one has done it. Yeah. What's that, uh, like a cool thing that you've seen during one of these field schools where you'd be like, oh, I need to see this in Victoria? Well, Jack, what you're working on is one of them, honestly. <laughs> so, so that is the first <laughs> uh, not going to name. <laughs> but Jack's working on looking at the, the uh, redevelopment of Centennial Square. But these projects in Copenhagen that I just thought, when we talk about inclusivity in the urban landscape, we often talk about age, inclusivity, and things like this, but this was looking at people that are almost never considered, even by the most inclusive planners. So the folks, a lot of them say that hang out in Centennial Square right now, um, you know, that might be transient or might, many are homeless. We went down and actually met and talked with a bunch of them and did a little bit of a mapping exercise. And, you know, had some really compelling visions for what Centennial Square should be like. Had some real, um, uh, well, Jack, you should explain all this, but had, the, right. <laughs> <laughs> had some, you know, some real vision. And, and actually, a lot of um, um, sort of meta-analysis of that space understood, listen, we like to sit in the square and smoke weed. We know that, but we know that families that come through there might not want there to be lots of weed smoke. So we would love to have a place where we could sit and smoke weed and there'd also be places where families and kids could feel safe. We get it. We get that some people don't want to hang around us, right? So what what opportunities are there to, um, uh, to promote public spaces that truly, truly care about teenagers, truly care about folks with addiction issues or drug users or folks that are, you know, without a house or something like that, right? How, how are, is the city made welcoming for them? And so Copenhagen has done some really innovative things to that extent, and deep, deep, deep um, uh, public participatory processes, meeting with folks for an hour and a half and listening to what their needs are and what they want to see in a park. 